Shabbat Shalom and happy Armed Forces Day. As you all can see, we're watching the Facebook video here. I'm wearing my red, white, and blue tie. Armed Forces Day is about recognizing, honoring, saluting those who are currently serving, or who have served in the American military forces. And so, today I've prepared a sermon called The Art of War. And the key scriptures are Leviticus 26, verse 8, and 2 Chronicles, verse uh, chapter 20. And it's, you know, it stems, or at least based upon, Parsha Behar Bechotai, which is uh, the double Parsha we have today from Leviticus 25 to 27. But again, I'm focusing on Leviticus 26, verse 8, and uh, then also much more on Second Chronicles 20. So again, Shabbat Shalom and happy Armed Forces Day. You know, one of the... One of the oldest and uh, uh, books on warfare was written by a man called Sun Tzu. And Sun Tzu, a Chinese general, lived about 500 years BCE, before the Common Era, or BC. His most famous writing is called The Art of War. In its 13 chapters, it's... Um, in his 13 chapters, uh, Sun Tzu laid down some basic principles of how to wage war. And uh, amongst his advice were these statements. All warfare is based on deception. He also said that hold out baits to entice the enemy, feign disorder, and crush him. Pretend to be weak that he may grow arrogant. If he is taking his ease, give him no rest. If his forces are united, separate them. Attack him where he is unprepared. Appear where you are not expected. If he is secure at all points, be prepared for him. If he is in superior strength, evade him. Are those, you know, they seem like very common sense rules for warfare. And for centuries, generals and military leaders have studied Sun Tzu's teachings and used them for the basis of their battles and military campaigns. This is how battles are waged and how wars are won. But if you think about it, I'm pretty sure that Sun Tzu's art of war never dealt with a battle quite like the one that we're going to be talking about today. In our Parsha today, we read in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 8, it says, Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. I mean... This is not how battles are fought, and it's not how wars are won in secular battle. But in, you know, we look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20. You may want to go there, take a look with me. We see that Israel's forces appear to be outnumbered by about three to one. And according to Sun Tzu, when you're outnumbered, you should run away. Right? When you're outnumbered, evade. But not King Yehoshaphat of Judah and his army, often called in the, in the translations as Jehoshaphat, but his name was Yehoshaphat and, uh, of Judah and his army. And not only did they not run away in the midst of being outnumbered three to one, and I'm sure they, they brought much in the way of weapons, or, you know, I'm, I'm not even sure about that, but in fact, their only tactical weapons, as we look at this chapter of Second Chronicles 20, seem to have been 
a promise from God and a glee club. We look at Second Chronicles 20, verse 21. It says, after consulting with the people, he appointed those who would sing to Adonai and praise the splendor of his holiness as they went ahead of the army, saying, give thanks to Adonai for his grace continues forever. Judah should not have won this battle. But they did because they had a promise from God. God promised them in Leviticus 26, verse 3, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments. And in verse 8, again, as we, we read it before, God promised five of you will chase a hundred and a hundred of you will chase 10,000 and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. That's pretty much what happened. Even though it might appear that they went out into this battle without much preparation, they actually did some major things to prepare themselves for this challenge. I'll walk you through this. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 3, they fasted and they sought, they were seeking Adonai. In 2 Chronicles 20, verses 6 through 12, they spent time in prayer. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 13, the whole nation participated. See, Judah was faced with an impossible situation, an army that was too large to defeat. And yet, because God was in it, because God was in it, they came away victorious. They won. A man named Don Francisco, and no, not the guy on Spanish TV from years ago, but Don Francisco, an American believer and singer who became famous since the 1980s, wrote in his song about this story in Second Chronicles verse, uh, chapter 20. He wrote a song about it, and in his song it said this. The Lord God set up an ambush, and he got the enemy all turned around. They started into killing each other, you know, till they all lay dead on the ground. And the riches and the jewels that they left behind, it took them three whole days to haul. The children of Judah all praised the Lord because he saved them one and all. Judah did not go out to battle because they believed their army could win the battle. They went into the battle because they believed that's where God wanted them to go and they trusted God for the outcome, whatever it was going to be. Let me give you an example. Two men went fishing. One man was an experienced fisherman, and the other, well, he wasn't. And every time the experienced fisherman caught a big fish, he put it in his ice chest to keep it fresh. And whenever the inexperienced fisherman caught a big fish, he threw it back. And the experienced fisherman watched this go on all day and finally got tired of seeing this man waste good fish. So he asked him, he said, why do you keep throwing back all the big fish you catch? And the inexperienced fisherman answered him, I only have a small frying pan. So what I'm saying is this. We don't set our dreams based on the size of our frying pan, but on the size of a God who's big enough to supply all of our needs in whatever the situation is. And God isn't going to be shaken by the size of your request either. The story is told of a man who asked Alexander the Great to give him a huge sum of money in exchange for his daughter's hand in marriage. And the ruler consented and told him to request of his treasurer whatever he wanted. So the man went and he asked for an enormous amount. The keeper of the funds was startled and said he couldn't give him that much without a direct order from 
Alexander. So the treasurer went to Alexander and argued that even a small fraction of the money requested would be more than enough to serve that purpose. No, replied Alexander. Let him have it all. I like that fellow. He does me honor. He treats me like a king and proves by what he asks that he believes me to be both rich and generous. In the same way, we should go to the throne of God in prayer and present our petitions that express honorable views of life, love, liberty, health, wealth, and peace. Our requests give God the opportunity, if he chooses, to show his power and his favor. You know, one rabbi uh, told of a sign that had his, uh, at his yeshiva and that read this way. When God is going to do something wonderful, he chooses a difficulty. But when God is going to do something very wonderful, he chooses an impossibility. And now I want you to notice how Yehoshaphat and the nation of Judah prepared for their battle. They put together a worship team and they went into the battle singing praises to God vastly outnumbered with superior forces and weaponry. Anyone else took their little force into battle would think this is it. <laughs> you know, this is it. This is the last day. We won't see another sunrise. Nope, not these. They marched into battle with a worship team. And they marched into battle singing praises to God. And I thought... I thought it was very interesting that God didn't tell them to do that. Well, I'll let you win this battle if, you know, you put together a worship team and you all sing praises to me as you're marching out, out into the battle. God never said that. You see, they decided to do that all on their own, all on their own. But I believe that a single decision expressed their confidence in God. And I believe that this single decision gave an extra boost to God's victory that day. Because, in, you know, it says in Psalm 50, verses 14 and 15, it says, Offer thanksgiving as your sacrifice to God. Pay your vows to the Most High and call upon me whenever you are in trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will honor me. And in Psalm 50, verse 23, God promised that whoever offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice honors me, and to him who goes the right way, I will show the salvation of the Lord. Thanksgiving to God seems to unleash an extra measure of God's power because this offering of thanksgiving gives God the glory and praise that honors him. So what I want to do today is have some praise. If you like, you can follow along in your own Bible. Turn with me to Psalm 150. Let's start there. I have the CJB translation, the Complete Jewish Bible translation. Turn with me to Psalm 150. A psalm of praise. It says, Hallelujah. Hallelujah is a Hebrew word, a plural command, meaning let us together praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God in his holy place. Praise him in the heavenly dome of his power. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with a blast of the shofar. Praise him with lute and lyre. Praise him with tambourines and dancing. Praise him with flutes and strings. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud crashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise Adonai. Hallelujah. And now Psalm 100 for Thanksgiving. A psalm of Thanksgiving. Shout for joy to Adonai. Let all the earth. Serve Adonai with gladness. Enter his presence with joyful songs. Be aware that Adonai is God. It is he who made us and we are his, his people, the flock of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving 
enter his courtyards with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For Adonai is good. His grace continues forever and his faithfulness lasts throughout all generations. We are in a time of need. We are in a time of great danger, of great trial, tribulation, and distress. We need to praise God and offer thanksgiving to him because we are doing battle. I'll get into that in a little bit. But now, the last thing I want to do is to examine something very important. How Israel responded to their victory. We normally look at it, wow, they went out with this small force, this huge, uh, uh, this huge, you know, army, this, this tremendous army that you couldn't see the end of, and they were outnumbered three to one, outgunned, outnumbered, and yet they go into this war singing praises to, to God, and who's going ahead of them? The worship team is in front of the battle. And that we notice and that we're excited about. But we don't look at how they responded after they won the battle. How did they respond to their victory? The first thing they did is they received great blessings. Second Chronicles verse 20, uh, sorry, chapter 20, verse 25 says this. Yehoshaphat and his army came to take the spoil from them and found among them personal property in abundance and corpses with precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves until they couldn't carry any more. They took three days just to collect the spoil. There was so much. Judah had sought God's guidance. They had fasted, they had prayed, and then they went forward in praise. And they did all this before the battle even occurred. As a result, the enemy wasn't just destroyed, but Judah walked away richer than he ever was before they came. Likewise, no matter how our own day turns out, because we have entered into it by seeking God's guidance, by fasting, by praying, and because we have set this day aside as a day of praise, we will walk away from this experience richer than we started out on our journey with God. Second, Judah renamed the valley. This is important. This is critical. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 26. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 26. Let's check it out. On the fourth day, they assembled in the Valley of Bracha. That is the Valley of Blessing, where they blessed Adonai. Hence, that place was called the Valley of Bracha to this day. They renamed that valley, and they renamed it the Valley of Bracha, which means the Valley of Blessing. From that day forward, it was a reminder to them of the power of of God. Every time someone passed that valley, they were reminded of what God has done. Have you had a victory in your life? Did you face death and beat it because of God's help? Then rename that time, rename that day, rename that month, rename that season, rename that house, rename that street, Rename that stairwell, rename that room, the room of blessing, the stairwell of blessing, the street of blessing, the hospital of blessing. It's no more uh, Mount Sinai. It is, the, it is now the mountain of blessing, Har Bracha. It's every time. people of Judah would have passed by with their children and their grandchildren, that valley, they would tell them the story of what happened, of how they went out with this tiny force and against unbeatable odds that in any other situation, they would have been decimated. They would have been destroyed down to the last man. The kingdom would have fallen. And they told them the story of how they 
fasted and they prayed and they sought God's guidance and they put together a worship team and they went into that battle with their small force, praising God. And they won. Today, today, this is the Valley of Bracha for us. We face the most devastating challenge of our lives. It's a war with an invisible enemy, a war with a virus. We can't see it, can't touch it, and yet it is very much there. Just like God, can't see him, can't touch him, and we know he's there. But this war, this world war with this virus, it's life or death. It's the battle of our lives. It's the battle for our lives, and only God can make a difference. You see, only God, and I'm sure you've heard this before, only God can turn a mess into a message, a test into a testimony, a trial into a triumph, and a victim into a victory. For several months now, God has unleashed all his legions of angels to do battle for us against this virus and against the adversary. The archangels, Gabriel, Michael, Uriel, Raphael, leading their divisions. And Yeshua, the mighty one of Israel, is leading the way for the army of God. Who is fighting for you? Who is fighting for you? God is doing battle for you. Don't be in doubt. The Bible is the only unvarnished, pure and absolute truth in the whole world. It says in 1 Samuel 17, verse 47, so all this assembly will know that Adonai delivers not with sword and spear, for the battle belongs to Adonai. God will do battle for you. One of the titles that God is known by in the Bible is Adonai Tzivaot in Hebrew. This means the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies. And the Lord of hosts is doing battle for you. This virus and its timing has been called by some as a supernatural thing in its nature. Biblical. I must say, I first looked on those comments with dubious eyes and ears, but I have felt lately in my spirit that this is true. And while I considered it, I was led to the prophetic scripture in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 12. Maybe you want to look on it with me. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 12. It says, next, there was a battle in heaven. Michael and his angels, it's Michael and his angels, fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But it was not strong enough to win so that there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown out. That ancient serpent, also known as the devil and Satan, the adversary, the deceiver of the whole world. He was hurled down to the earth, and his angels were hurled down with him. And then they heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come God's victory, power, and kingship, and the authority of his Messiah. Because the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them day and night before God, has been thrown out. They defeated him because of the Lamb's blood and because of the message of their witness. Even when facing death, they did not cling to life. Therefore, rejoice, heaven, and you who live there. But woe to you, land and sea, for the adversary has come down to you. And he is very angry because he knows that his time is short. I said before that only God can make a difference. Only God can make a difference. Only God can win this war against this invisible enemy. And that at the head and command of all of heaven's armies is Yeshua the Messiah. But in order for you to know him, his true mission, you need to know who he really is. You need to accept who he really is. So many doubters. Or those who believe in Yeshua as the Messiah, but say he was just a man or he was just a prophet, but he's not divine. He's not God. Oh, he's the son of God, but he's not God. 
oh, he was a man. How can you kill God? How can you have killed him if he was God? And so much doubt. Well, let's reveal the truth right from the word of God here. Isaiah the prophet spoke of Messiah's true identity in chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, he wrote, His name will be called Pele Yoetz El Gibor, Aviad Sar Shalom. Wondrous counselor, mighty God. Father of eternity, Prince of Peace, Yeshua is mighty God. And in the good news of John chapter 20, verses 19 through 29, this is what we see. This is after the crucifixion. It was evening on that day, the first day of the week, when the doors were locked where the disciples were, for the fear of the Judean leaders. And Yeshua came and stood in their midst, and he said to them, Shalom Aleichem, peace be to you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands, and he showed them his side. And then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord, and Yeshua said to them again, Shalom Aleichem, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And after he said this, he breathed on them. And he said to them, receive the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Remember that the word Ruach, spirit in Hebrew, also means wind and breath. If you forgive anyone's sins, he said, they are forgiven. But if you hold back, they are held back. One of the twelve, Thomas, called the twin, was not with them when Yeshua came. And the other disciples were saying to him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied to them, unless I see the nail prints in his hands and put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, the disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. And Yeshua comes despite the locked doors and he stood in their midst and said, Shalom Aleichem. And he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it here into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. And Yeshua said to him, because you have seen me and you have believed. But blessed are the ones who have not seen and yet they believe. You see now, without doubt, loud and clear, in truth and in spirit, that Yeshua is God. So now we can know, we can see that he is the leader of all of heaven's armies. He is Adonai Tzivaot. He is the Lord of hosts. And Yeshua knows the true and the real art of war. Not Sun Tzu, not the famous generals or military commanders of history. Because Yeshua is God, and God is doing battle for you. And my friends, God has never lost a battle, and he never will. The battle belongs to the Lord. And you and I, as believers and followers of Yeshua the Messiah, are soldiers of the Messiah. And in the end, it will be our prayers and our praises to God, our fasting and our faith in God our belief in Yeshua as God that saves us from death and gives us eternal life. So persevere, keep strong, keep striving. We don't need the art of war because we serve the master of war, the forever undefeated champion of all. And Yeshua's message to us now in this time is this. Do not be afraid. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. For fear not, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. He is the Lord of hosts, and in him we will prevail. We will overcome. In him we will have victory. We will have victory. And I pray for each and every one of you today your families, for your health and healing, protection, wisdom, blessings, and faithfulness, strength and courage in the name of Messiah Yeshua, the highest name above all names. And in Yeshua's name I say, Amen.
So Shabbat Shalom and happy Armed Forces Day.